to come and speak. And uh, this came about really because I was going to be in Orkney. We thought, well, you know, let's have a busman's holiday and have a bit of a chat about what's going on. Now, sitting on the green benches watching Brexit unfold for the last two years, if it wasn't so important and it wasn't so tragic, it would be like an ealing comedy. What we saw a month ago was a government who had painted itself into a corner with red lines, come up with a white paper that, frankly, having now read it, is a shopping list to have cake and eat it. It's literally a list of all the bits out of the EU that they suddenly discovered were quite good, actually, and saying, can we stay a member of that, or can we have a reciprocal arrangement that means it's exactly the same as if we were a member of that. And yet, three weeks ago, on the Monday in the Customs Bill, the government accepted three amendments from the Rees Mogg crew that actually tear their white paper to shreds. Now, the idea of a government writing a white paper and then actually voting against it is something I can't imagine has ever happened before. So, they accepted amendment that meant they cannot have any kind of border in the Irish Sea. That means the backstop, as it's called, that Europe demands to protect the island of Ireland from a border has been made illegal. They also said that the UK would never collect customs for the EU, even though that is actually the central point of Theresa May's proposal in her white paper. And the third thing they did was they said the UK must come out of the computer VAT system that Europe uses, even though that was again put forward as a way of avoiding a border on the island of Ireland. Now the problem is, is and I'm sure you've seen all this, this brings a no deal and a no transition Brexit closer because they have simply made something that was never going to just be accepted utterly incoherent. And that's actually quite frightening. Now the worry is when you've got a government that are talking about stockpiling medicines and stockpiling food, now, that's not the kind of panicky language a government would normally use. So what is there that's actually worse than that that makes them think it's worth them talking about a no deal and us running out of food and us running out of drugs? Now, I don't know whether it's so that we all feel so relieved when they come up with any old kind of deal that we're thinking isn't that great. Certainly as MPs, we're going to get a vote on the final deal. But it's going to be utterly Hobson's choice. Because we'll have the deal, whatever it is, and we'll have no deal. So the problem is, is if we vote against the deal because it's rubbish, are we left with absolute catastrophe? And when the Liberals say we should have a people's vote, they need a final vote on the deal. That's exactly what you would have. You would have a choice between the deal which might do huge damage to Scotland and the rest of the UK, or no deal. And we're now seeing no deal obviously dramatised into something that looked like a post-Armageddon movie. So, is it that that's where we're headed? Or is it that they're trying to intimidate and frighten both the public and MPs into supporting whatever they come up with? And the problem is, Literally, the government started painting itself into this corner with red lines before they did any impact assessment, before they looked at what we get from the EU, before they looked at what it would mean to lose some of these things. Now, I started writing and speaking about the EU before the referendum, and I didn't talk then about, oh my God, the sky will fall. I tried to remind people about the benefits that we've had, and particularly the benefits that we've had for health. And that was how I wrote about it. Please be aware of what you're getting from Europe. Something that unfortunately our media has never covered in 40 years. Europe's made a convenient whipping boy, a convenient thing to blame for politicians. Well, we would sort that, but the EU won't let us sort it. Oh, it's the EU's fault. It's not our fault. But that isn't true. And you've never read a story or heard anything on the media telling you anything good that you were getting from Europe. Now the number one thing 
that is an impact both on our health and our NHS for Brexit is the staff who work here. Now, okay, I've got a vested interest. My husband, Hans, who's German, is sitting there. He's been a GP in the Scottish Health Service for over 30 years. Two years on, we still do not know for certain what his rights will be. Because at the moment, the rights of EU nationals is still sitting there, not turned into law. So what if there's a new deal? What happens to the agreement to allow EU citizens to stay? I can tell you that EU citizens were very frightened by what happened to Windrush. Because it wasn't just Windrush citizens, it was the children of Windrush citizens who suddenly discovered they didn't have rights. And we are losing EU nationals. There's been a 90% drop in EU nurses coming to work in the UK. 90% drop since the referendum. That means, in essence, that source of nursing staff has dried up. Surveys by the BMA, British Medical Association, or the GMC, the General Medical Council, showed between 45 and 60% of EU doctors would consider leaving. Scotland's already losing 14% of them. They're already in the process. They've got new jobs, they're moving house. We've lost them. Workforce is one of our biggest challenges here in Scotland. Now, it's actually the biggest challenge for all four UK health services. And when people go, how come waiting times are getting longer? Well, that's because you're not treated by a building. You're not treated by a machine. You're not just scanned by a machine. You're looked after by people. And if we don't have enough people, then we struggle to deliver the service, to run the clinics, to run the operating lists, to run the x-ray scanning lists. We need people. And we didn't vote to leave. Scotland is being dragged along this route totally and utterly against our will for something that started purely as the fighting within the Tory party and as a way to see off UKIP. David Cameron promised a referendum so that his more right-wing, Eurosceptic Tories wouldn't vote UKIP in 2015. He thought he would probably need to be in a coalition again and therefore he could blame the Liberals and say they won't let us do a referendum. But of course he won. So he had to deliver the referendum. When we debated how that referendum would be run, it was Cameron who insisted we didn't include 16 and 17 year olds like we had in our Scottish referendum. The young ones who have the most to lose by us coming out of Europe. Their chance to study, to work, to live, to marry anywhere in 31 countries. They didn't get a voice. The people for whom it's existential the European citizens who live with us, who work with us, who live in our communities, who provide services for us, they didn't get a voice either. So literally, this referendum was promised and then set up as badly as possible, almost to ensure that they would lose. Hard to understand. The campaign on both sides was pitiful. On the Remain side, it was just the sky will fall. It only talked about finances. It only talked about the City of London. On the Leave side, we now know it was an utter and complete pack of lies. And we also now know that they bought it with illegal, dark money. And to me, that's the argument for saying that that referendum should be null and void. And there should be another vote. It was illegal. And it was bought illegally. And yet, they won't consider that. <coughs> so we are looking down the barrel of this change of being dragged out of Europe and all the impact that that will have. The other thing I spoke about before the referendum was the agencies, the cooperation, the European Medicines Agency. New drugs that are discovered are launched in America and Europe at almost the same time because Europe is a market of 500 million people. It now goes through one licensing process for the whole of Europe. Countries like Canada and Australia get new cancer drugs about a year after us. That's where we are. Only some pharmaceutical companies have said to me, well, 
it takes so long for the NHS to pick up a new drug, we may not actually come to go through the UK system for maybe two or three years. We're coming out of Europe just when there is a new clinical trial system. We're not going to be part of that, even though the UK, and particularly Scotland, punching way above its weight, we have been research leaders in health. <clears throat> we're not going to be part of that. And if we're not on the newest drugs because of not being members of the European Medicines Agency, we won't even be using current best practice to compare with. And Europe is the biggest research network in the world. It's bigger than China, it's bigger than America. And we've been part of it, and we've gained from it. The UK was one of the biggest beneficiaries of all of this research. That's why we've been leading in life sciences and pharmaceuticals. So the whole access to new drugs will be harder for us. Being part of discovering those new drugs will be harder for us. And friends that I have who are still in the medical research world are already being asked to step aside. So programs that they have led on that are now going forward for Horizon 2020 funding, they are being told, well, we'll let you cooperate, but you really cannot be the principal investigator because otherwise this project won't get funded. So this is already changing things. And the last step, we do have a big pharmaceutical industry in Scotland and in the UK. And the last step of that is quality control. And the rules are that must be done inside European boundaries. And that means that that's another set of jobs that will just gradually leach away from Scotland, from the UK, onto Europe. We produce drugs that we send to Europe. Europe produces drugs that they send to us. Many of these drugs have to be transported, kept chilled, etc. And one of the issues is going to be how difficult is it to get things through the border. Now, in Ireland, the border is a political issue. And being from Belfast, and like every other family in Northern Ireland, having lost someone to the troubles, I know how frightened the community are there about the impact of Brexit on them. But that doesn't apply at Dover. New technology could help. Smart gates, pre-registration, number plate recognition could help at Dover. But yet, two years on, despite the government always spiting that these are the answers to these new customs posts, they haven't done anything. Dover hasn't changed. There's no extra parking, there's no new technology. And as someone worked out if it was even two minutes per lorry coming through Dover, the delay would literally be hours and hours and hours. So one of the issues that we're going to have is the drugs coming in and the drugs going out. Now, I'm not going to talk about a no deal and all that kind of stuff, but pharmaceutical companies are looking at what they call stockpiling. Zanofi who make insulin have increased their 10 week back up to 14 weeks. How much difference is that really going to make if we're struggling to get anything in or out? Other companies have increased their stockpiling by 20%. But they can't do more. They don't have warehouses anymore. Most production is what's called just in time. <clears throat> so things are planned to be produced somewhere in Europe, to move to somewhere else, to move to somewhere else, precisely when they're required. If you look at aerospace or cars, literally the bumper for your Mini arrives at 9 o'clock and it's on a car by 10. That actually happens in the pharmaceutical side as well. And all of these supply chains have developed right across Europe. Different components are put together and finally made into the drugs that we use. What it's certainly going to add is expense. So all four NHSs will have to pay more for drugs, may have to do more stockpiling themselves. One of the issues that I've raised in Parliament is the issue of radioisotopes. For medical scans. Now, we're leaving URATAM, which is the European Atomic Agency. And there was no absolute reason to do that, and people were quite surprised when it was suddenly there in the Article 50 letter, but they're doing it. They say it's no problem because they've passed a new law here to deal with materials for nuclear energy. And when I raise, and indeed the President of the Royal College of Radiologists has raised, 
issue of medical radioisotopes, they just say, well, they're not explosive. That doesn't matter. They're not ruled by your atom. Except we had a world shortage of technetium, which is the main thing we use in scans, between 2008 and 2010. And as a breast cancer surgeon, I lived through that, having to sit there in clinics and choose who I would do my one bone scan because that was how much technician we would have. A new technique that we use for sur surgery to the lymph nodes in breast cancer patients to do less harm, cause less side effects, was massively delayed because we used technician and it wasn't available between 2008 and 2010. So what Euratom did, the Euratom supply agency, said, well, actually, we'll start managing this. We'll make sure that if one system is having trouble, another reactor doesn't do servicing and shut down. They have managed it since we have had no shortages. We're not going to be part of that anymore. How confident are you that Jeremy Corbyn won't see the light? Uh, maybe he'll propose a, a Norway-style uh, arrangement, you know, Norway plus style arrangement. Uh, how confident that he wouldn't do that? And, and if he does do that, wouldn't that also make the argument for an independent Scotland seem a little less urgent? I don't think it seems less urgent. I mean, frankly, if you got a lift with someone and they turned out to be drunk and they nearly drove you out the, over a cliff, would you say, oh, good, we made it, can you give me a lift to Tyson? No, you wouldn't, you would get me the car. So I, I don't think it changes that at all. The problem is Jeremy Corbyn has been a Brexiteer all his parliamentary life. He has voted against the EU in every single vote for the last 20 whatever, 30 odd years that he's been in Parliament. So that's the problem Labour have, is his front bench are largely Brexiteers because that's how he's picked them. And his back benches are largely people who see the damage and are trying to get him to change. Now, he has finally moved to a customs union, not the customs union, but a customs union. And we had a time where literally they said something different every month. But the European withdrawal bill has already gone through. You know, he has thrown people out of his front bench <coughs> for voting for single market and customs union. I'm sure Keir Starmer would like to see him move. Oh, two years down the line, and we've got eight months left. And the problem is that doesn't give us a majority in the House of Commons. What it does give us is a basis. When I've spoken to some of the Tory rebels who believe that it is utterly damaging to come out of Europe, and I said, why, why did you not vote for that single market customs union amendment? And the reply was, why would I destroy my career when I don't even know if Labour are going to get out of their benches or whether they're going to abstain? Whereas if they knew that the whole opposition could see the damage of Brexit and were going to vote against some of these clauses in, in the laws that were coming through, that would have helped some of the Tory rebels to actually stand up and be counted. Now obviously in, in the recent vote in the Customs Bill, some of them did and we won a few amendments. But equally on the other hand, we had the government themselves voting for in essence, wrecking amendments from this group led by Jacob B. Small, these Brexiteer ultras. That's just hard to understand. They would have been able to see them off because these amendments were disastrous. The opposition would have voted against them, the government could have voted against them and seen them off. But it's all about power, it's all about staying in power. And Theresa May was just desperate to get to the, the finishing line for the summer. So I, I don't see it happening. I would welcome it if it did, because it would at least form a basis for some of the Remain voices within the Conservatives to say, this is just damaging. Why would you want to go ahead with this when this is so destructive? But you still think that wouldn't uh, you know, make the independence of seem less? Well, I'm sure some people will say that. Yeah. <laughs> We yeah, got away with it, you know, right. we're okay, so we don't need to be independent. Really? You want to have your entire future always on the flick of a coin, tossed by someone else? I mean, uh, to me, that, that is madness, and that's what we've seen for this last two years, is that what is important to Scotland 
EU nationals are really important to us. Immigration is absolutely critical to Scotland. All of our population growth in the next decade will come from people settling here, from elsewhere. If we do not get that, because Westminster has an absolute stranglehold on getting immigration numbers down to the tens of thousands, it's not just that we won't have enough doctors and nurses. We won't have enough people paying tax to be able to, to support our older people or our children or our hospitals. So it's absolutely existential. And we were promised during the, the, the Brexit referendum that, oh yes, Michael Gove said, yes, of course, we'll devolve immigration to Scotland. But they absolutely won't agree to do that. So to me, it doesn't matter. And of course, there will be people who go, great, it don't, we don't need to do it. I think we absolutely need to do it. Because what's around the next part? Did we really think we'd be in this middle right now? Well, I totally agree. I, mean, I agree with you. Like, <coughs> I guess my thought was that it seems to be there's two things going on. On the one hand, uh, there's, there's, there's um, uh, some sort of uh, impetus behind the independence argument from the fear of Brexit. If you soften that by, you know, generally if this Norway style uh, idea came to the fore, uh, it's almost as if then there's a different argument about independence is back to democratic deficit the whole bit. All the stuff I agree with you with. But that's, you know, again, Brexit like, falls out of the picture as, as being the issue. I don't, I, it won't fall out, it won't fall out of the picture because if you look at the, if you look at the impact assessments, even what we're asking for, the softest of soft yeah, Brexit, yeah, yeah. is still a drop in our GDP. It still means we'll be poorer. Yeah. It still means we'll have lost jobs. It still means people will have lost income. And it still means we'll have less money to fund our public services. Um, obviously, that's the least worst option. If Jeremy came to that, the opposition are still in minority. And believe me, you know, when they ring the bell and the Tory whips sit there at either end glowering at their own MPs, there's very few of them who are willing to rebel. Um, but I would welcome it. There's no way I wouldn't welcome it. I don't want harm to happen elsewhere in the UK either. Scotland has a lifeboat. Northern Ireland has a lifeboat. England and Wales don't. They voted for Brexit. At the moment, they still largely seem to believe in it. But the damage won't be to the Reese Mogs, who are incredibly wealthy, who's already putting his money offshore, or the John Redwoods, who's advising his clients to put their money offshore. It'll be ordinary people. And I, I don't want to see that anywhere in the UK. So if there's a way of softening Brexit, I would be happy enough to soften Brexit. Thank you, <laughs> right, well, as you can tell, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from around these parts, but I am quite a user of the NHS. Uh, back in 2002, after a motorcycle accident, eventually ended up losing the bottom half of my left leg. Was taken to an NHS prosthetist down south, who turned out to be a private company. And eventually I saw sense, moved north up here to Orkney, taken to Aberdeen, where the proper NHS prosthetist took one look at what I had been given south and said, who the did this for you? That was long before Brexit. The privatisation is already happening down south in the NHS. Nearly every department is privately run now. The number of private nurses in the NHS, because the NHS there isn't paying enough or the agencies are paying more, so they're private nurses. That's happening now. It was happening before, it was happening 12 years ago. So Brexit, you know, just because we may get another referendum, we may not get Brexit, certainly doesn't mean to say that Westminster isn't going to force privatisation of our health. And having lived in the United States, I can assure you one thing, you do not want to go through health insurance, ever. Well, I, I, 
totally agree with that, and I think everyone would agree with that. Uh, I mean, I remember a young chap posting his bill for an appendectomy uh, on the internet. $55,000 is what it cost. And you have to pay a share of that. So his family had to find $11,000, even though, luckily, by about two months, he was still covered by his father's work insurance. But three months later, he'd have been hit for all of that. So I don't think anybody wants to go down that line. But yes, I mean, the thing is, it wasn't just the Health and Social Care Act that brought private players in. It was actually Labour that started bringing in independent treatment centres with private uh, contractors in it. And the problem is, is that just the Tories have accelerated it and, and kind of sent it, um, you know, super orbital. The problem is, part of it is the money, the sheer waste of money. Part of it is, as I said, the fragmentation. You can't link up a pathway for a patient if all the different bits are kind of competing rather than cooperating. And what I certainly know from, from obviously spending time with NHS people down in England through my role as the health spokesperson at Westminster is that patients are having to pay for more. So they're having to pay for quite a lot of things. I don't know whether they'd be paying for prosthetics, but breast cancer patients are having to pay for some of the bits and pieces that they need. Cataract surgery, hip surgery, knee surgery is all being rationed. Um, and therefore more people are being driven to have it privately. On the NHS, in most NHS hospitals in England, you can only get one cataract done, but you can pay the NHS £850 to do the other one. You'll only get one hearing aid, you can pay money to have a second hearing aid to the NHS, not to a private hospital. It used to be the rule was that an NHS hospital could not make more than 2% of its income from private patients. Labour changed that to 49%. So big hospitals with a big name in London are actually attracting private patients in, who of course leapfrog over ordinary people and get their operation done in that NHS hospital quicker. And when Virgin Care take over a service, they take over a building and a scanner that we paid for through our taxes. They take staff that we trained because they don't train staff. So these private companies still leech utterly on the back of the NHS. And all of that drains away the ability of the NHS to make itself sustainable. What the private companies do normally is they cherry pick the easy stuff. The people who are fit, the people who need a small operation, kerching. But if you've got something chronic or expensive or difficult, the NHS is left with that. And if you look at the finances in NHS England, the five years before health and social care come in, they came out with basically, you know, 500 million at the end of the year. You know, money they found down the back of the sofa or managed to scrape together. They just made it. They literally started to go into deficit immediately after that passing, to the point where they were two and a half billion in deficit. And that is purely because they're wasting money on administering the system. <coughs> also, they get left with the expensive patients. The private companies suck off the easy patients. So it is really damaging, and if you speak to anyone that you know who works in NHS England, I'm sure they will tell you exactly the same. They see their NHS being undermined and undercut from inside by their own health department in Westminster. And the reason for all the challenges we face and all the difficulties we have in Scotland, we don't have that, and why we are still the best performing health service out of all four is because we run it. But with them taking on public procurement, with them taking more and more things back to Westminster, will, will we get to keep that in the long term? We don't. We can cross our fingers and we can hope. Or we could actually decide we don't want to risk that. These things should be for us to control and for us to protect. Question, then, yeah. Okay, um, you mentioned how the Electoral Commission had found that the uh, Brexit referendum was uh, basically fraudulent, crimes were committed, there's a lot of dodgy money involved and potentially foreign government influence. So my question is, how can we ever trust any other referendum result or election result? And how do we prevent something like that from happening? 
happening again at the next independence referendum? Well, I, I mean, I think this is a real issue. I think the, the, the outcome of that inquiry and the fact that they've been given a slap on the wrist, a £60,000 fine, I mean, for the likes of all of these elite groups, that is, you know, spare change. Um, it is just not good enough. And the problem between fake news that is dressed up as real news and, you know, Russian involvement in uh, social media information here or manipulation of both elections and uh, referenda it is very frightening. And it's frightening as a politician. You know, you read something, you share it or you comment on it and it turns out to be fake news. And everyone laughs at you. But, you know, it was in a proper newspaper or it was a, a, a Twitter handle with a blue tick that meant it should have been the person that it, it, it uh, was supposed to be. It, it really is a very difficult world to live in. And that's why, to me, rather than a people's vote, which is Hobson's choice, the more honest thing of the government would have been saying, all bets are off. You know, we have evidence of foreign governments involved in this. We certainly have evidence of utterly dodgy money, of drastic overspending, of linking all of these groups, all of which is against the rules. Um, and I think that it would be very important, whether it's in future elections or a Scottish referendum, that we ensure that that, that can't happen. Now, that's very difficult. Well, it, it's very difficult. Obviously, elections in Scotland are run by the Scottish Parliament, and it's important that they look at laying down, for any election or for any referendum, that they lay down rules that are strict enough and tight enough that if that was found to have happened, it would negate it. And to me, I think that, um, I mean, they say they've handed these files to the police. I think it would be really important that the police follow this through that people do end up in court. It can't be that you can buy a referendum if you have enough money and reap the havoc that Brexit is going to reap. And, and you've done it utterly because you've got the money and other people have I mean, that, we talk about our democratic deficit here, but obviously that's a democratic deficit for everybody. And it's a huge challenge. We haven't worked out the answer to it. The travel insurance to Europe is cheaper because it's underwritten by the e system. Your travel insurance will get more expensive. But there will be people who simply can't travel anymore. People with severe chronic illnesses. You try getting travel insurance if you have a severe chronic illness and you will find out how expensive it is. There have been patients who are on dialysis, who have been able to travel to Europe and actually arrange that their treatment would be ongoing. You're not going to be able to cover that with travel insurance. Did we ever hear any discussion about that? No, we didn't. And the problem is, all of these things are going to impact ordinary people. People are still walking around thinking, A, it may never happen. B, it's never going to happen to me. I don't run a business. Or if I run a business, it's not an export business. Brexit means nothing to me. Brexit will affect all of us, and it will affect our children or our grandchildren, because they won't have the same rights that we've had. My husband's parents were not allowed to marry. They met during the war. His, husband, his father is German, his mother is Polish, and they were not allowed to marry. And a child that they had was taken away from them. His father was lifted by the Gestapo, his mother was a forced labourer. And they only got to marry right at the end of the war. My husband used to say long before we got into this burg, I can't believe that in one generation I can marry who I love and live and work where I like. That isn't normal in the rest of the world. You know, you have to get a green card in America. It's not easy elsewhere. And yet we've been able to travel and work and do what we like right across 31 countries. And we might all be settled. We might all know where we live and what we're doing. But unfortunately, it's being taken away from the next generation. They won't have the opportunities that we had. Maybe we used them. Maybe we studied in Europe. Maybe we traveled in Europe. Maybe we didn't. But we had a choice. And that's been taken away from them. And Brexit is, of course, now being used to undermine 
devolution to the Scottish Parliament. Now, there are lots of people in Scotland who don't believe in independence, but a majority believe in devolution. The reason our health system is so different from the one in England is because it's controlled from the Scottish Parliament and not controlled from Westminster. If it was controlled from Westminster, we would have the same privatising drive that is happening in NHS England, that had literally tens of thousands of people marching through London at a rally back in July, saying, save our NHS, protect our NHS from privatisation. We wouldn't be getting our services from the NHS. We'd be getting them from Virgin Care, as happens in patches all across England. You can have staff who go off on maternity leave working for the NHS, and when they come back, they find they don't work for the NHS anymore. They work for a private company, Circle or Virgin Care. Virgin Care is the biggest provider of health care after the government in England. And with a new health secretary who has received significant <coughs> funding from a think tank that believes that the NHS should be got rid of and replaced by insurance. You have to wonder, NHS staff in England hated Jeremy Hunt, but it could be out of the frying pan into the fire. And one of the 24 powers that's going to be taken by Westminster that gets overlooked is public procurement. In England, Section 75 of the Health and Social Care Act means that NHS contracts must be put out to tender between private companies and the NHS. <coughs> we don't do that. We don't have to do that. But if it's all going to be tr controlled from Westminster at the top, we have no idea. Maybe they'll leave us alone if we're lucky, if we keep quiet, if we keep our heads down. But maybe they won't. And Scott, the Scottish NHS is very good at procurement. We do our procurement centrally, so we get a better price. They don't do that maybe. So they waste a lot of money buying lots of different versions of CAT scanners or MRIs or rubber gloves or aspirin or whatever. We don't do that in Scotland. We've managed to get rid of a lot of that waste. And in England it's estimated that they waste over 10 billion a year just administering their healthcare market. Because they are still doing it as buying and selling. We got rid of that after devolution. And that means our health service is able to make the money go further. We're able to work together, and that's the biggest thing. NHS England has become totally fragmented because everyone is competing with everyone else. Whereas for all the challenges we face, and we face the same three challenges, increased demand with an aging population, workforce I've already talked about, and money is tight. But what we're not doing is facing that with one hand tied <laughs> behind our back because we're wasting all of this money on buying and selling healthcare that they're doing in England. But they're going to take control of public procurement. And it doesn't get much mentioning fishing and agriculture and food safety and food standards. And these are all things that are clearly to do with doing a post-Brexit trade deal with Trump. And I'm sure there's people in this room that were kind of scared about TTIP. And I was someone who spoke a lot about my concerns about TTIP. But I'm afraid a Tory Trump trade deal is even more scary. And if you look at those 24 powers, you will see that that is about selling our food and drinks industry, our Scotch whiskey, etc., for an American trade deal. I've read the American demands for a trade deal. And right in there is that they demand to be able to sell their whiskey as scotch. That instantly destroys our whiskey industry. Our food and drink, the Scottish brand, Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, these are premier brands that people recognise. Food labelling is one of the other powers. So if you're getting your hormone injected beef or your GM food or whatever, we're not going to be in control over whether that has to be labelled. You know, we say can, consumers can make the choice. So we're not going to be able to control all of these things. And that is what's happening. So we have Brexit itself, but then we actually have the way Brexit is being used to undermine the Scottish Parliament. And that's something that people who are not independent supporters, 
need to have discussed with them, they need to wake up to see what's happening. We didn't choose this. It doesn't matter who you vote for as an MP. Down the road, we can't make that change. England gets what England votes for. In the House of Commons, English MPs get what English MPs vote for. And sadly, Labour is all over the place on Brexit as well. They're utterly... Um, Corbyn has always been a Eurosceptic, and their position just changes literally week by week or month by month. So when they say what they believe in Brexit, it's not really that different from Theresa May. So there isn't an easy alternative that is going to come from Westminster. To me, this is clear. What has happened in the last two years, how our vote on Europe has been disregarded, how the vote of the Scottish Parliament to withhold legal consent for the European withdrawal bill has been disregarded, how powers are going to be taken back to Westminster over devolved areas, meaning they have the final control means that we are going to have to, at some point, face the decision. Do we start making our own decisions, or are we happy to just be dragged around in the mud like a rag doll? You'll see it on social media. Well, surely you don't expect the tail to wag the dog. Surely you don't expect 8.3% of the population to decide what happens in the UK. Of course I don't. But that's exactly the reason why Scotland needs to be independent. If you're never, ever going to be listened to in the UK because you're only a bit of it, then you'd be better making your own decisions. And we're not small. Actually, one third of all EU countries are the same size as Scotland or smaller. So we're not too little to do this. And seeing what's happened over these two years shows us what the future is. As the UK government has moved further and further to the right, as the differences between England and Scotland become more and more dramatic over what we want and what we are voting for. We are going to have to face that choice. And I think it's important that if you are speaking to people, that you are polite, that you are gentle. Don't be blaming people for what they did in 2014 or what they thought in 2014. We didn't have a crystal ball, they didn't have a crystal ball. Back in 2014, people felt Staying in the UK was the safe option. That was the big straight road in front with big street lights. It looked the obvious thing to do. Voting for independence meant that you were voting for a turnoff. You had no idea what was down that road. And there were people who were frightened. We know there were people who were lied to to make them frightened. But people were frightened of that. Well, there isn't any status quo anymore. You simply have a choice. You either go down the road of Brexit in the UK and everything that that brings, all the change and upheaval that that brings, or you vote to go down the other path and start making your own decisions as a normal, independent country within Europe. There isn't any other route. There's only those two. And to me, the difference is in one, we're in the boot of Theresa May's car. We're not being listened to, can't change anything, we're just told to shut up and take it. In the other one, we're in the driving seat. We decide what our future is. We decide what kind of Scotland we want. And we decide how we interact with the rest of the world. As Winnie Ewing said, stop the world, I want to get on. Scotland wants to be an outward looking, modern European country. And when people say to me, how come you want out of one union and you want to stay in the other? Because those two unions are utterly different. Europe is all about legality, which is something the UK government still don't seem to have understood. They think, well, we're Britain. It's a gentleman's agreement. Just give us a good deal. And that's how they have gone into Brexit repeatedly. Europe is about writing it down in legal language in black and white so there's no room to manoeuvre. Translated into all the languages so there's no misunderstanding. Europe would never have put normally in the Sewell Convention. They don't do weasel words like that phrase, not normally. Westminster will not normally overrule the Scottish Parliament. And what we're told is these aren't normal times. So Westminster's going to do precisely that. <coughs> Who defines normal? Westminster. 
So they will do that whenever they choose. And that was made clear in the House of Commons by David Mundell. Whenever they define that they need to overrule the Scottish Parliament, they will. It's not just the 24 powers, they can overrule the Scottish Parliament at any time. Europe is not about that. The 28 countries don't stay together on a gentleman's agreement. They stay together and they trust each other because all doubt is removed. Everything is negotiated down to the last full stop. And that's what the UK government has never been prepared for, has never taken to Brussels. That's why they keep not making any progress. Because they come with a load of flour and Europe goes, yes, but we need proposals. We need something in black and white. And when the, when the government brought forward their white paper, the EU governments were saying, great, well, we're not going to accept it how it is, but at least it's something in black and white. And then the government vote against it. So what is their proposal? Brussels has no idea, frankly. And that's the difference between the two unions. In one, we are ruled. And I can tell you, sitting there for two years on the green benches, we are, well, three years now, actually, on the green benches. Oh, that's a bit of wonder I get somewhere. Um, we get overruled. And we bring our voice. We speak up for Scotland. We stand up for Scotland. But in the end of the day, Westminster just decides what they want to do. And they're not thinking of Scotland at all, not even slightly. And for us, we need a government that is doing what we tell them. And it's not just being able to vote in who you want and not have a government that you never vote for. It's being able to vote people out. We can't vote people out. There's nothing that we can do right across Scotland that ensures the government in England changes. And that means our voice, our needs, aren't listened to. Scotland is one third of the UK landmass. We face utterly different challenges with 8.3% of the population. You hear on social media all the time, oh, you know, we're so generous to you with Barnet. We give you 9.3% of funding yet to run one-third of the UK landmass. Roads, rail, broadband, hospitals, schools, across one-third of the UK landmass. 70 inhabited islands. You know, none of that is recognised down there. And if more people watched, and I wouldn't inflict this on you, Parliament Live, and heard the dripping contempt of, from the government benches when they mention the name Scotland, we'd already be independent. So to me, and I don't have to make the decision, and I'm glad I don't have to make the decision of when there will be another referendum, but I think another referendum in Scotland is inevitable. Because we can't be dragged into the mess that is Brexit, into a totally different United Kingdom from the one that many people voted to stay in in 2014, with no choice. So I think there will be another choice. And it's all of our jobs to educate ourselves, to think about it, to find out about it, to not vote as many people did ignorantly in the Brexit vote with no idea about people having options and understanding what those options are. And that's down to all of us. So I think we're going to have a busy couple of years ahead. As I say, be gentle with people, be polite. Remember, people will have voted how they voted for different reasons. We're not here to blame or to punish or to moan. It's to try and convince people that Scotland is a country that's worth voting for, that we could actually drive our own futures, and that we could be the generation who would build that. It will be hard work. I am utterly do not ascribe to the tap on the head with fairy dust and everything is magic. It's not. But finally, we would be able to make decisions that Scotland needs made, not decisions that are made for London and the southeast of England, which is how decisions are made at the moment. So I'm happy to take questions, but I hope that I've given some of you something to think about, to talk about among your friends, your colleagues, because we have a lot of big decisions to make going forward from now. Thank you.
Your operational journal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Any questions? You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> behind you. John, behind you. Look behind you. Nothing so close. Oh, um, Philip, in the uh, independent newspaper recently, they're running a campaign to get people to sign up to demand a certain, you know, this people's vote on Brexit. Now, as I understand, what they're saying is that the Speaker, the House of Commons, can accept amendments before you vote on the final deal. And there may be an amendment put forward saying, call for this people's vote, which is a three-way question, you know, to accept a deal, to reject a deal, or to stay as we are. Is that realistic? Is there any hope at all or possibility of that coming off? I think there's no possibility at all of us being given a three-way vote. Uh, I mean, these things, we've already raised this in, in the House of Commons. I don't think there's any way they would allow us a three-way choice. It's also quite a hard referendum to run, to be honest, because you don't end up with a majority. So when you've got two different quests, uh, three different choices. But I don't think the government would ever accept that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the people's vote, if it is just deal or no deal, is the same Hobson's choice that we're going to face. Why would you? Well, I think they're, they're just trying to show that there is momentum, that people don't accept what's happened. Mm -hmm. To me, it would be more honest to actually say we think that legally the vote is suspect mm -hmm. on the basis of the Electoral Commission's findings about all the, all the money moving around in vote leave and, and, and Russian involvement and all the rest of it. So, to me, I think that one would be more honest, that you're actually having a proper choice again. But but a people's vote is is a Hobson's choice unless, as you suggest, there is a third choice, and that, the choice to stay. And I do not see that happening. My problem with it is, would it be run on the same basis? So we still exclude young people, we still exclude EU citizens, and Scotland's voice means nothing. What threshold would we have to get to before our voice would count? Would 72 do? Would 82 do? We already came out and voted to remain. Mm -hmm. So if we come out and vote to remain even more strongly, I mean, polls say Scotland would vote 73% to remain. Would that make any difference? So I would find that quite hard to sell to people up here unless it was on some separate basis. That if Scotland clearly voted to remain, we were allowed either a referendum or what we put forward as a compromise deal Scotland's place in Europe, which is Scotland would stay in the single market and customs union, even while remaining within the UK. Basically, they put forward that proposal twice. The UK government basically threw it out. I'm not sure if they even read it, but they certainly threw it out. <coughs> Me and Mike don't go well together. Yeah, yeah. don't go to it. Just a wee bit closer. Well, yeah. Just, we want to hear what you've got to say. Having lost a cousin to breast cancer in 2010, hearing what you said there about making the decisions between 2008 and 2010 gave me chills. Now, we're part of the youth team, and we actually have um, a reader I've written in yesterday who's got a child that suffers from type 1 diabetes, and she's absolutely terrified of the situation with insulin. Is there anything at all you could say that could just maybe put her mind to rest a little? Well, one of the drug companies that is talking about lengthening their kind of buffer from 10 weeks to 14 weeks is a company that, that produces insulin. Um, I mean, I really would hope that the no deal, the kind of storming out of the room, Armageddon no deal, would not happen. Europe doesn't want that to happen either. And there is still a potential that even if there isn't a free trade deal, even if there isn't a deal going forward, that there'll be, if you like, a basic minimum that would allow certain things to travel, and particularly medicines. Many drugs will be made in this country, so I think that people, and, and that's why I'm concerned for a government to be talking about stockpiling food and difficulty <coughs> accessing food and drugs, it just seems a very bizarre thing for a government to be doing because normally they'd be pretending everything's fine, even when it isn't. So I, I'm, I'm a bit anxious about that. And I wonder whether it's the fear that if it came either to a people's vote on the deal or the MPs vote, the MPs will simply feel they cannot vote against the deal if it means a no deal. 
So I think people should try not to panic about these things. There may be impacts, but I would hope that most pharmaceuticals and, and the NHS will be looking at how they make sure that for these critical medicines we have enough. It may be that what she's on is, is produced here in the UK. So I think that people shouldn't panic about the, the drugs and food. I don't know why the government's talking like that, but I think it is to create fear, which seems a very old thing for a government to do. But there is no question that we may have delays of things moving in and out through customs, and that's why pharmaceutical agencies are looking at having a longer buffer. Um, but I would hope that it wouldn't affect drugs uh, like it. And so I think that she should try not to panic at the moment. But I, I understand that. I mean, and like it, you know, lots of people of my age, you know, I've got a pill box. I'm on lots of things. Uh, I don't want them to run out or, or have difficulties either. And obviously, as a breast cancer surgeon, part of what I'm thinking about is more our involvement in research, our involvement in new drugs, our access to new drugs um, going forward. And that is a real concern. And for children, through the European Medicines Agency, it's not just licensing of drugs, they've actually run a lot of research or targeted a lot of research on rare conditions and particularly rare congenital conditions in children. We have made more progress in the last 10 years on childhood congenital illnesses than literally in decades, purely because the European Medicines Agency targets money and research to that. So there's a, a lot of the things going forward that we're losing. But I would hope that, that drug supply is as important as insulin and will be protected. Thank you. Um, my, my youngest son also is diabetic uh, patient, and so I was about to ask you some of the question. But besides that, he, um, he also is dependent on continuing health care um, because of his learning disability. And I'm also extremely anxious that the reduction in money for the NHS will have a knock-on effect for care. Um, and he's in, in England as well. And I just wondered if you could say anything about that. Well, obviously, Theresa May promised the uh, 20 billion to the NHS by 2023. The, one of the big concerns in that is that 9 billion of it is marked down as Brexit dividend, which nobody other than people with theories at the bottom of their garden believe in. Um, the Office of Budget Responsibility actually estimates that the UK economy will be 15 billion loss rather than, than any gain um, from Brexit. And so that's going to make public services all more difficult. I think actually for someone who's got care needs, um, like learning difficulties or disabled, we come back to the issue of workforce. Within the social care workforce, the proportion of EU nationals is even higher. And the problem is they don't qualify for tier two visas, the highly skilled visas. Now, because Theresa May is so obsessed with immigration, they turned away over 2,000 non-EU doctors between December and May who actually had jobs. They'd been interviewed, they'd been given the job, but the hospital have to get a sponsorship form to be allowed to apply with that person for a tier two visa. And they turned them down, even though NHS England has 100,000 vacancies for nurses, doctors, and, and, and other professions. They turned them away. So the problem is people in the social care world don't even qualify for something like that. And we've still not heard what their immigration proposal is going forward. So there's been a lot of discussion in protecting EU citizens who are here so that they can stay. But we have utterly no idea what will be the rules for someone coming uh, from Europe afterwards. And the turnover of nurses and care workers is about 25%. So people come, they stay a few years, they tend to go back home. Doctors who come tend to settle. Um, so that means you actually need a continuous <coughs> of nurses and care workers who are coming and unfortunately they, they don't feel welcome, they feel frightened. Uh, certainly trainee doctors think, well there's no point in joining the UK training system and then being made to leave and they now don't fit in the training system back home. So within the health and social care side, workforce is still going to be one. Don't get your horns up. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, don't ask anyone on sport or, or on media and uh, Coronation Street, because I don't know those things. <laughs> Trivial pursuits, I can't do them. Anything else? Some of the back. Yeah, this, this is not a big medicine, but um, some of the stuff that I've been reading and listening to is the basics that major part of the... I mean, I agree with you about the very positive things that come out of uh, Europe as far as health and many other things are concerned. But many years ago, one of my friends had a visitor who worked in, the, in, in Europe, and he said, people don't understand this is actually about a military alliance. And at the present time, there appears to be, from certain sectors of British commentary, that despite the fact that they're going for Brexit, the other thing that's happening is almost like pre-First World War secret treaties and military arrangements between Britain and France and other countries that never come before Parliament. Um, I'm, I'm, not aware, I'm, I'm not aware of this, that they don't come before Parliament. To be honest, I'm more concerned about the way we're aligning ourselves with America, yeah. both from trade, um, you know, food standards, they want rid of what's called the precautionary principle, um, and obviously they're very militaristic and the UK tends to run in on their coattails. So I, I'd be much more frightened about those military um, uh, relationships rather than uh, within Europe, in, in that Europe does not yet have any kind of joined up um, military system. One of the reasons that we're getting out on the 29th of March though, uh, which isn't just about trade, it is, is about things like tax avoidance. 1st of April next year, the new tax avoidance rules in the UK uh, become active and become law. And so there's lots of people who think that's why it's got to be 29th of March and not a week later. Sorry, the precautionary principle is just that unless a drug or a food stuff or an additive is proved safe, you, you use precaution, you don't allow it unless it's safe. Whereas America takes the other view that you only ban something once it's proved dangerous. Uh, whereas the EU is very much so, the EU doesn't allow GM crops, they don't allow hormone fed beef, they don't allow, uh, or hormone injected beef, they don't allow chlorine washed chicken. I mean the chlorine washed chicken is not actually the chlorine, it's why they wash the chickens in chlorine, because their animal husbandry rules around chicken rearing are appalling uh, and they have very high incidence of food poisoning. So that's why they wash the chicken in, in, in chlorine. So, so Europe tends to take a very, a very safe view and America feels that's anti-trade and they want that changed. And one of the big asks in their trade demands is very much that the UK, out, after Brexit, outside Europe, gets away from that and, and moves more towards the American do you think it's right that those MPs who have private interest in healthcare should be allowed to vote on the NHS? Uh, I utterly don't. Uh, if you were a councillor and you were making a decision about a block that you had a shop in, you'd have to leave the room. And yet, members of the House of Commons, members of the House of Lords, are allowed to vote even though they have financial interest. And we saw that around the Health and Social Care Act. If you look at the people who voted for it, who either own or have an involvement in or have major shares in um, private health companies. And, and this is one of the big concerns, obviously. You know, America would love to get involved more. We already do have American companies who are involved in NHS England. But at the moment it's relatively small and some of it hasn't made profits uh, the way they expected. But NHS England is about to go through yet another reorganisation where they're going to join local services into what they call a footprint or an accountable care organisation which will be run, and, and you could see it as a good thing, I, I think joining up services is a good thing, a bit like our health state for health has been, um, had significant funding uh, from a think tank that advertises and pushes that the NHS is a sacred cow that has outlived its usefulness and that actually it would be much better if we had a, an insurance based system. So it's quite concerning to see where that's all going to Question right there in the back, John. Nick? Do you think that those of us 
As I said, back in 2014, people saw the status quo of the UK and thought that was a safe place to stay. Now, there were people, certainly, I worked with nurses who had elderly relatives who had their doors knocked to be told that it's a yes and Thursday there'll be no pension next week. The UK pension is the second worst in Europe. So people were lied to, but people will have made their decision to stay in the UK for many different reasons. And I totally understand, as I say, the status quo looked like the safe decision at that time. But staying in the UK now means taking Brexit. And there only is a hard Brexit or a no-deal Brexit. Because they've ruled out staying in the single market and customs union. They're not trying to be as close to Europe as we can. And while all the talk in Parliament is about trade and customs and all those challenges, the biggest benefits we've had from Europe have been through the agencies, through working together as 28 countries, fighting the biggest challenges that we face. And the biggest challenges that we face are things like cybercrime, terrorism, climate change, the refugee challenge. You can't do those things as one country. And that's what basically is the advantage of being in Europe. So to me, people have to have another choice. There'll be people who come to a second Scottish referendum and still want to stay in the UK, no matter what. And that's their choice. But they should be aware of what that choice means. It's not a status quo UK. It's a Brexit UK. And therefore, it is not a big main road and a turn. It's a fork in the road. So people have to inform themselves and people have their own values and their own things that are important to them. And in the end of the day, everyone has the right to a vote and a decision. How confident are you that Jeremy Corbyn won't see the light? Uh, maybe he'll propose a, a Norway-style uh, arrangement, you know, a Norway-plus-style arrangement. Uh, how confident that he won't do that? And, and if he does do that, wouldn't that also make the argument for an independent Scotland seem a little less urgent? I don't think it seems less urgent. I mean, frankly, if you got a lift with someone and they turned out to be drunk and they nearly drove you out the, over a cliff, would you say, oh, good, we made it, can you give me a lift to town? No, you wouldn't, you would get out of the car. So I, I don't think it changes that at all. The problem is Jeremy Corbyn has been a Brexiteer all his parliamentary life. He has voted against the EU in every single vote for the last 20, whatever, 30 odd years. So that's the problem Labour have, is his front bench are largely Brexiteers, because that's how he's picked them, and his back benches are largely people who see the damage and are trying to get him to change. Now, he has finally moved to a customs union, not the customs union, but a customs union, and we had a time where literally they said something different every month. But the European withdrawal bill has already gone through. You know, he has thrown people out of his front bench for voting for single market and customs union. I'm sure Keir Starmer would like to see him move. We're two years down the line, and we've got eight months left. And the problem is that doesn't give us a majority in the House of Commons. What it does give us is a basis. When I've spoken to some of the Tory rebels who believe that it is utterly damaging to come out of Europe, and I said, why, why did you not vote for that single market customs union amendment? And the reply was, why would I destroy my career when I don't even know if Labour are going to get out of their benches or whether they're going to abstain? <clears throat> Whereas if they knew that the whole opposition could see the damage of Brexit and were going to vote against some of these clauses in, in the laws that were coming through, that would have helped some of the Tory rebels to actually stand up and now obviously in, in the recent vote in the customs bill, some of them did, and we won a few amendments. But equally on the other hand, we had the government themselves voting for, in essence, wrecking amendments from this group led by Jacob Rees Mogg, these Brexiteer ultras. That's just hard to understand. They would have been able to see them off because these amendments were disastrous. 
the opposition could have voted against them, the government could have voted against them and seen them off. But it's all about power, it's all about staying in power. And Theresa May was just desperate to get to the, the finishing line for the summer recess. So I, I don't see it happening. I would welcome it if it did, because it would at least form a basis for some of the remaining voices within the Conservatives to say, this is just damaging. Why would you want to go ahead with this when this is so destructive? But you still think that it wouldn't be you know, make the independence of seem less. Well, I'm sure some people will say that. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. got away yeah. with it. Yeah, you know, we're okay, so we don't yeah. need to be independent. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You want to have your entire future always on the flick of a coin tossed by someone else? I mean, uh, to me, that, that is madness, and that's what we've seen for this last two years, is that what is important to Scotland, EU nationals are really important to us. Immigration is absolutely critical to Scotland. All of our population growth in the next decade will come from people settling people from elsewhere. If we do not get that, because Westminster has an absolute stranglehold on getting immigration numbers down to the tens of thousands. It's not just that we won't have enough doctors and nurses. We won't have enough people paying tax to be able to, to support our older people or our children or our hospitals. So it's absolutely existential. And we were promised during the, the, the Brexit referendum that, oh yes, Michael Gove said, yes, of course, we'll devolve immigration to Scotland. But they absolutely won't agree to do that. So to me, it doesn't matter and of course there will be people who go great and don't, we don't need to do it. I think we absolutely need to do it. Because what's around the next corner? Did we really think we'd be in this middle right now? Well I totally so, agree, I, mean, I agree with you. Like, <coughs> I guess my thought was that it seems to be there's two things going on. On the one hand, uh, there's, there's, there's uh, some sort of uh, impetus behind the independence argument from the fear of Brexit, if you soften that by, you know, generally if this Norway style uh, idea came to the fore, uh, it's almost as if there was a different argument about independence is back to democratic deficit uh, and all that. All the stuff I agree with you with, but that's, you know, again, Brexit falls out of the picture as, as being the issue. I don't, I, it won't fall out, it won't fall out of the picture because if you look at the, if you look at the impact assessments, even what we're asking for, the softest of soft yeah, Brexit, yeah, yeah. is still a drop in our GDP. It still means we'll be poorer. Yeah. It still means we'll have lost jobs. It still means people will have lost income. And it still means we'll have less money to fund our public services. Um, obviously, that's the least worst option. If Jeremy came to that, the opposition are still in minority. And believe me, you know, when they ring the bell and the Tory whips sit there at either end glowering, at their own MPs. There's very few of them who are willing to rebel. Um, but I would welcome it. There's no way I wouldn't welcome it. I don't want harm to happen elsewhere in the UK either. Scotland has a lifeboat. Northern Ireland has a lifeboat. England and Wales don't. They voted for Brexit. At the moment, they still largely seem to believe in it. But the damage won't be to the Reese Mogs, who are incredibly wealthy who's already putting his money offshore, or the John Red, who's, who's advising his clients to put their money offshore. He'll be ordinary people. And I, I don't want to see that anywhere in the UK. So if there's a way of softening Brexit, I would be happy enough to soften Brexit. Thank you, Sean. <coughs> Do you want to use the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> right, well, oh dear. As you can tell... <laughs> As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from around these parts, but I am quite a user of the NHS. Uh, back in 2002, after a motorcycle accident, eventually ended up losing the bottom half of my left leg. Was taken to an NHS prosthetist down south, who turned out to be a private company. And eventually I saw sense, moved north up here to Orkney, taken to Aberdeen, where the proper NHS prosthetist took one look at what I had been given south and said, who the 
did this for you. That was long before Brexit. The privatisation is already happening down south in the NHS. Nearly every department is privately run now. The number of private nurses in the NHS, because the NHS there isn't paying enough or the agencies are paying more, so they're private nurses. That's happening now. It was happening before, it was happening 12 years ago. So Brexit, you know, just because we may get another referendum, we may not get Brexit, certainly doesn't mean to say that Westminster isn't going to force privatisation of our health. And having lived in the United States, I can assure you of one thing, you do not want to have, go through health insurance, ever. Yeah, well, I, I would totally agree with that, and I think everyone would agree with that. Uh, I mean, I remember a young chap posting his bill for an appendectomy uh, on the internet. $55,000 is what it cost. And you have to pay a share of that. So his family had to find $11,000, even though, luckily, by about two months, he was still covered by his father's work insurance. But three months later, he'd have been hit for all of it. So I don't think anybody wants to go down that line. But yes, I mean, the thing is, it wasn't just the Health and Social Care Act that brought private players in. It was actually Labour that started bringing in independent treatment centres with private uh, contractors in it. And the problem is, is that just the Tories have accelerated it and, and kind of sent it, um, you know, super orbital. The problem is, Part of it is the money, the sheer waste of money. Part of it is, as I said, the fragmentation. You can't link up a pathway for a patient if all the different bits are kind of competing rather than cooperating. And what I certainly know from, from obviously spending time with NHS people down in England through my role as the health spokesperson at Westminster is that patients are having to pay for more. So they're having to pay for quite a lot of things. I don't know whether they'd be paying for prosthetics, but breast cancer patients are having to pay for some of the bits and pieces that they need. Cataract surgery, hip surgery, knee surgery is all being rationed, um, and therefore more people are being driven to have it privately. On the NHS, in most NHS hospitals in England, you can only get one cataract done, but you can pay the NHS £850 to do the other one. You'll only get one hearing aid, you can pay money to have a second hearing aid to the NHS, not to a private hospital. It used to be the rule was that an NHS hospital could not make more than 2% of its income from private patients. Labour changed that to 49%. So big hospitals with a big name in London are actually attracting private patients in, who of course leapfrog over ordinary people and get their operation done in that NHS hospital quicker. And when Virgin Care take over a service, they take over a building and a scanner that we paid for through our taxes. They take staff that we trained because they don't train staff. So these private companies still leech utterly on the back of the NHS. And all of that drains away the ability of the NHS to make itself sustainable. What the private companies do normally is they cherry pick the easy stuff. The people who are fit, the people who need a small operation, kerching. But if you've got something chronic or expensive or difficult, the NHS is left with that. And if you look at the finances in NHS England, the five years before health and social care come in, they came out with basically, you know, 500 million at the end of the year. You know, money they found down the back of the sofa or managed to scrape together. They just made it. They literally started to go into deficit immediately after that passing, to the point where they were two and a half billion in deficit. And that is purely because they're wasting money on administering the system. <coughs> also, they get left with the expensive patients. The private companies suck off the easy patients. So it is really damaging, and if you speak to anyone that you know who works in NHS England, I'm sure they will tell you exactly the same. They see their NHS being undermined and undercut from inside by their own health department in Westminster. 
And the reason for all the challenges we face and all the difficulties we have in Scotland, we don't have that. And why we are still the best performing health service out of all four is because we run it. But with them taking on public procurement, with them taking more and more things back to Westminster, will, will we get to keep that in the long term? We don't know. We can cross our fingers and we can hope. Or we could actually decide we don't want to risk that. These things should be for us to control and for us to protect. Okay, um, you mentioned how the Electoral Commission had found that the uh, Brexit referendum was uh, basically fraudulent, that crimes were committed, there's a lot of dodgy money involved and potentially foreign government influence. So my question is, how can we ever trust any other referendum result or election result? And how do we prevent something like that from happening again at the next independence referendum? Well, I, I mean, I think this is a real issue. I think the, the, the outcome of that inquiry and the fact that they've been given a slap on the wrist and £60,000 fine, I mean, for the likes of all of these lead groups, that is, you know, spare change. Um, it is just not good enough. And the problem between fake news that is dressed up as real news and, you know, Russian involvement in uh, social media information here or manipulation of both elections and uh, referenda. It is very frightening. And it's frightening as a politician. You know, you read something, you share it or you comment on it, and it turns out to be fake news. And everyone laughs at you, but, you know, it was in a proper newspaper or it was a uh, a Twitter handle with a blue tick that meant it should have been the person that it, it, it uh, was supposed to be. It, it really is a very difficult world to live in. And that's why, to me, rather than a people's vote, which is Hobson's choice, the more honest thing of the government would have been saying, all bets are off. You know, we have evidence of foreign governments involved in this. We certainly have evidence of utterly dodgy money, of drastic overspending, of linking all of these groups, all of which is against the rules. Um, and I think that it would be very important, whether it's in future elections or a Scottish referendum, that we ensure that that, that can't happen. Now, that's very difficult. Well, it, it's very difficult. Obviously, elections in Scotland are run by the Scottish Parliament, and it's important that they look at laying down for any election or for any referendum, that they lay down rules that are strict enough and tight enough that if that was found to have happened, it would negate it. And to me, I think that, um, I mean, they say they've handed these files to the police. I think it would be really important that the police follow this through, that people do end up in court. It can't be that you can buy a referendum if you have enough money and reap the havoc that Brexit is going to reap. And, and you've done it utterly because you've got the money and other people have. I mean, that, we talk about our democratic deficit here, but obviously that's a democratic deficit for everybody. And it's a huge challenge. We haven't worked out the answer to it. Can I just uh, mention one other um, issue? Many of us have friends and um, relatives, family in Ireland or Northern Ireland. Uh, people from the North, travel to south to work every day and vice versa. People go shopping on either side of the border. I mean, the, the border, the, the two economies are completely integrated. Northern Ireland voted against Brexit. Ireland doesn't want Brexit. They will also suffer quite a bit. Would the UK in the end maybe regard Northern Ireland as being expendable and just write them off, join the Republic, do what you want, but we're keeping our Brexit. I, I'm not sure that the UK government would. Um, there were polls of Leave voters in England about what their view, um, what did they feel about if they lost Scotland versus doing Brexit, if they lost Northern Ireland versus doing Brexit, and they chose Brexit. They didn't care whether they lost Scotland or lost Northern Ireland. So for people who are very driven about Brexit, they don't care about the union. I know that the union is important to many people up here, but it's kind of unrequited love. If you look at everything the UK government has done, you know, including riding roughshod over the Scottish Parliament, none of that helps to strengthen the union. 
But as I said, having grown up in Belfast and, and having lost uh, a cousin to the Troubles, there isn't a family in Northern Ireland on either side that isn't anxious about what's going to happen. Now, if you had set out to try and undermine the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, you couldn't have put together a worse sequence than what the UK government have done. So you do Brexit, which creates a border. Now, this is why the EU are absolutely backing Ireland in saying there cannot be an actual physical border between the North and the South. It's not just that people go to work and shop, and absolutely they do, but healthcare has been redesigned on the island of Ireland. So paediatric heart surgery is only in Dublin. People from Donegal with a heart attack go to Derry. They don't go down to Galway. So, you know, to disrupt any of these things. And there's about 300 crossings Smart of the border that open when you, you yeah, know, whatever, show your magnetic something or other on your lobby. That is all infrastructure. And the fear of the police in Northern Ireland is that all of that will become a target. That's what happened in the Troubles. They, the customs posts were manned by customs officers. Then they had to be protected by police. Then they had to be protected by army. And they are terrified that if you put anything, even just a camera on a pole, on that border, you will actually end up having to have a protected camera on a pole, and then eventually a defended, protected camera on a pole. So, you know, don't underestimate how important the issue of Ireland is. And as I say, the solution, which everyone agreed with other than the DUP, including in polls the majority of people in the Protestant community in Northern Ireland, was that you kind of have the border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. There's already a border for live animals to protect the island of Ireland. You already have to check the health of animals that are, that are going from Scotland to Northern Ireland. So for many people, they wouldn't have seen that as being disruptive at all. But one of the amendments the government accepted three weeks ago makes that illegal. So they literally have painted out one of the last possible solutions that they had. And that's the bit of the withdrawal deal. The backstop for Northern Ireland <coughs> is what leads to getting a transition deal. And that's how they could lose a transition deal and literally be facing all of this next March. Eight months away with no preparation. No preparation for a deal and certainly no preparation for no deal. Could I ask one more? I'm trying to uh, do it sort of with Orkney base. So people in Orkney, uh, I don't want to generalise, but I'm about to, I suppose, um, like the agricultural and the fishings, you know, so they don't like the common agricultural policy and they don't like the common fisheries policy. So we've got that transition of some people that will have voted um, yes in the referendum, but have also voted to Brexit. How do we cross that transition? We've been doing stalls on the street and we've been trying to raise the provenance of Orkney, mm -hmm. uh, along with Keep Scotland the brand. So how can we cut through to people to make them realise how this is actually going to impact on their lives, on their livelihoods as fishermen and as farmers, whether it's in Orkney or the north of Scotland? Is there anything that we can actually do to try and cut through? Well, I mean, the decision of how far into Europe Scotland goes is a decision for Scotland. And it should be a decision for Scotland on its own. We voted 62% to remain. So you know, remaining in the single market and customs union is, is a no-brainer. But whether we actually go all the way into the EU, that might be something that we require another referendum on for people to make that choice. But it should be our choice. It shouldn't be a choice that's made by the 85% other people in the UK and we just like it or lump it. And I would suggest that fishermen look at the white paper that Michael Gove produced three weeks ago. Because that talks about no subsidies for fisheries it talks about the quotas that are already controlled by the UK staying exactly as they are. So not regionalising them down to towns and coastal villages and ports, um, which is what actually the common fisheries policy is in its reform is trying to do. It's trying to make it a bit more like Norway, that you allocate quota to local areas where fishing is important. They're not trying to do that. They didn't consult with the Scottish government according to the answers I got in the House of Commons. They simply have published their white paper. And 
The Scottish Government com can comment like any of us. That's their view, and yet that's a devolved area. They also are then talking about that they will not let other countries come and fish in our wider waters, the kind of uh, exclusive zone that goes out to 200 mile limit. Now, the majority of fishing waters in the UK are Scottish. The biggest part of the industry is Scottish, and yet Scotland has never had a voice. And the problem with the common fisheries policy and for fishermen in Europe is we've never been at the top table. It took Richard Lockhead seven years to even get in the same room. So when people say, oh, the common fisheries policy, and suddenly the Tories are all over it, look at us, we're standing up for fishermen. Who was it described Scottish fishing as expendable in the 70s? Ted Heath and the Conservatives. Who was it that put us further in and accepted changes in 1990? Mrs Thatcher, Conservative. The first I could find of any Conservative moaning about common fisheries policy was about 2010, 2011. The SNP have been campaigning for reform of it since the 70s, since Winnie Ewing. We have said that there are problems with the common fisheries policy, but the problem that we have is that if we are utterly outside Europe, who are we going to sell our fish to? They're talking about being further away than Norway from Europe. Well, Norway pays tariffs on any processed fish between 6% and 12%. Now, if fishermen land their raw fish straight into Poland, where they've got a lot of fish processing, then they can land more of it at zero tariff. But if they land it in Scotland to be processed and frozen and trimmed and packaged here, it'll meet the tariff. So in actual fact, what you might find in any parts of Scotland where we have both fishing and fish processing, is that processing may end up not happening here and those jobs will disappear. So all of this, oh, fishing, it's all going to be marvelous. We're going to not let people fish here, but somehow we think we're going to, they're going to accept our fish at zero tariff isn't going to happen. Now, the fishermen in the northeast of Scotland may think that all of us are going to eat more white fish, and that would be good. That would be good for all of us. It would be healthy. But my fishery, I'm in Ayrshire, and Troon has got the southwest Scotland fish market. Ours is langoustine and lobster. And I can tell you, in the economic circumstances we're facing, we won't be eating more lobster. 80% of what they catch goes to the European market. Lamb, the main market for Scotch lamb is France. If we have a no deal, they would face a 40% tariff. So the impact uh, on farming and fishing, because they also say there'll be no subsidies for fisheries, and they're also committed to having no direct farming subsidies. And many of our farms wouldn't survive without subsidies particularly the hill farmer. And what people forget, when I was talking about the two different unions, if you have all four countries sitting around a table talking about the future funding of farming in the UK, England has 17% less favoured area. Scotland and Wales are over 80%. Northern Ireland's over 70%. So for England, this whole business of hill farming, rough farming, crofting, sheep, it's not that big a deal. They've got lush land, they've got huge agribusinesses. That's what they're interested in. And the problem is, is when all four are sitting and they disagree over how subsidies or funding should be run in the future, at any point, the English government, which is what they are in devolved issues, can simply stand up and say, we're also the UK government, so this is what we're doing. And that is why the <coughs> Scottish government said that they would accept frameworks. They had to be agreed. They had to be negotiated. And that's not what has happened. They've overruled the Scottish Parliament. So at any point going forward, whatever works for English fishing, for English farming, is what we will get. We already have the 20,000 tonnes of Atlantic blue whiting, which is part of Scotland's quota, is traded to Norway to get cod, which is caught by the northeast of England. So our quota's already been traded away for, for fleet in the rest of the UK, even though fishing is a much more important industry in Scotland than it is anywhere else. So if fishermen and farmers think that they're going to be on a level playing field, they're not. That's what Europe was about. 
trying to make sure that you had a level playing field across all 28 countries, trying to make sure that you took account of richer and poorer of different kind of land. Look what happened at the Convergence Uplift in 2014. Scotland gets the lowest rate of farming subsidy from Europe in, of any country. So they sent 190 million to come to Scotland to lift us up a bit. 30 million made it to Scotland. The under, other 160 million taken by Westminster and divvied up across the other three countries. That is simply a sign of what will come. The English government in devolved matters is also the UK government. <coughs> And therefore, what suits English farming and English fishing is exactly what we need. Thank you. Any final questions? I think we all need a cup of tea. Yes, yes <laughs> aren't these problems because you're not getting proportional representation? It's simple as that. Do you know about that? Well, we had proportional representation in the Scottish Parliament, and, well, we, had, Scottish and Parliament. we had proportional yes. representation in the referendum, well, and that didn't that, say... That. 15 people on this island have not even vote in the UK Parliament. I, I mean, I, well, well we, we support proportional representation. What are my you first, doing about it in the Well, Parliament? my first action, my first day in Parliament was to take a petition to number 10 to support proportional well, representation. Good, and when the reporter said, why are you supporting that? when the SNP have gained so well when you got the 56 and you wouldn't have done so well with proportional representation, I said, because we believe in it. We're not just change our minds on different things. We absolutely believe in proportional representation. All the, all what the do you Scottish expect? All the, all the Scottish MPs? Yeah, well, all the Scottish MPs, I'm only answerable for 35 of them. Yeah, and okay. we all support yeah, proportional well, representation. Very, very but you very need very to important. remember, that is the issue. You've got 650 MPs, you have two big parties who take turns at being government. They do not want change. Labour do no, not no. want change. So the problem well, is... Why should you want change if you're winning exactly. all the time? So Absolutely. what's the advantage of staying in Westminster? In Scotland we already have proportional representation. If we wanted to change it, we could change it. We can't change it for Westminster. So can't, we can't. aren't you really wasting your time all the time? No, I'm fighting for Scotland. Fighting, to, I'm fighting, fighting for Scotland to be an independent country, well, and then okay. it is represented by proportional representation in our parliament. Oh, but the idea that 35 or even 59 Scottish MPs can sort what's wrong with Westminster mm -hmm. and sort what's wrong with politics in England, we simply can't do that. I'm sorry, that's not our job. Our job is to fight for Scotland, to speak up for Scotland in Westminster to try and make things better for Scotland. But you can't do that when you are literally the tail on the dog and the dog is not interested in what you want. And that's how they see us. Well, that we are the tail of the dog. The it's dog definitely tail. for these politicians that have really got the power. They, they will decide on everything. The referendum's irrelevant because it's, it's illegal. Yeah, but they're not accepting it as illegal, are they? Well, they might do it at the very end, but they still have the power to make all the decisions. They, 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 they won't accept it as illegal because they have too much vested interest. Well, that's very well, 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 Let me just close by asking you one question, which is a yes or no answer. All oh, right. Oh, me, yes. a yes or no answer. Uh, right. I'm sure I can now, do that. When you lifted yourselves off those seats in Westminster, mm -hmm. you lifted the hearts of at least half of this nation, will you be carrying on such bold and positive action for Scotland? Well, it won't be a yes or no answer. Um, it won't yes. always be uh, cleansing out. Um, what I can say is the walkout was not planned, despite what media may have told you. you to understand what happened if, with the walkout, you need to have watched the Tuesday. We were promised four times by David Mundell that we would have the opportunity to debate and amend what was Clause 11, what we claimed Clause 15, which meant that Westminster was taking these powers back. When we got to the last day before it went to the Lords, we pointed out we're not in the Lords. We don't believe in sitting in the House of Lords. And unlike the Liberals who still sit there and don't believe in it, we don't take seats there. So we were, as Scotland's governing party, excluded from where they then said they would lay amendments. But what I pointed out was actually every Scottish MP of every party was excluded from the debate and amendment around taking powers to Westminster. 
Don't worry, when it comes back to the Commons, there'll be lots of time to debate and amend. Fifteen minutes. All of it used by the Minister. Not one Scottish MP of any colour got to speak. Our points of order went on longer than the debate. And what Ian was trying to do was to call an emergency debate in the middle of Prime Minister's questions. When you call an emergency debate, you can call it to start now. That would have stopped PMQs and would have started the debate while all the media was watching on the issue of powers being taken back to Westminster, despite the views of the Scottish Parliament. If you watch it, what you'll see is initially the, the, the Speaker says, do you want to call it now or at the end? And then he obviously loses his nerve and says, no, 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 wait till the end. And he goes, no, I'm calling it now. I'm calling it now. And because he wouldn't sit back down, he was thrown out. And the idea that when our leader was thrown out of the Parliament, we would all just sit there like patsies, I'm afraid it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't planned. You'll see us all scrabbling to get our bits and pieces together to walk out. <coughs> I mean, I have to say, my husband said, does that mean you're coming home? Shall I be home? <laughs> and I've never so wished <laughs> more than that was the case, I can tell you. I know there are many MPs who like being in Westminster and for whom this is their career. It's not my career. I'm a breast cancer surgeon. If you cut me through the middle, it'll still say doctor. But we're there because at the moment we have to be. But believe me, any time you want to bring us home, we will come home really, really happily. Um, what we will not do is we will not go along uh, and, and pander to them. We can't always disrupt or change, but we certainly will not be making life easy. And particularly not when it is to pass law that is going to damage not just us, but ordinary people right across the country. Thank you very much. I think